right. Hey guys, welcome or welcome back. Tisha here, back with another Breaking Free, How I Escape Polygamy, the FLD is called, and my father, Warren Jeffs, by Rachel Jeffs. If you hear a lot of noise, I'm sorry. It's nice outside. Well, it's hot to me, but apparently the kids don't think so. You think they'd be hanging out by the pool, but they're hanging out outside too. So if you hear a bunch of commotion, I'm sorry, but I want to make sure that we get this done. Chapter 16, Life Goes On. Hit that thumbs up button for me. We moved back to South Dakota in August 2008, four months after the raid, and life returned more or less to normal. It seemed like I was pregnant constantly for the next few years after Rulon, I had a girl, Lavender, who was born in 2009. Then I had two miscarriages, the first at 12 weeks and the second at just 10 weeks. And both times, Rich wrote to father to tell him what happened. I hate that he always makes their father aware of everything because sometimes it ends up being a problem. Hopefully she's not punished for this. Hopefully he sees that this is beyond her control. Let's continue reading to see. Father told Rich to take me to a professional doctor to get a DNC. Okay, he actually did something good. Then in June 2010, I got pregnant again, and this time it took. Shortly thereafter, Rich came to my room and one morning, one morning and asked me to shower with him. I knew he'd been with another of his wives who was trying to start out with a baby the previous night. Rachel, what's wrong with you? Rich said when he could see me hesitating. You can't treat me like I don't know what you were doing last night, I said. It's not easy knowing you had intercourse with another wife and you come asking me to shower right after. It sure isn't. Why wouldn't you just shower with that same wife? How can you do that? Even though the law of purity said it was forbidden to have any sexual contact with when a woman was pregnant, Rich fuzzed this by doing pretty much everything but intercourse with me when I was expecting. So he has to follow uh, the father's rules when it comes to everything else. But I guess with this, he found ways around it. Okay. Rich looked taken aback. I had told myself to keep my thoughts to myself so that I wouldn't risk punishment. You're a child now, I guess, since you get punished. It's crazy that an adult has to worry about being punished by another adult. But I had to speak up. I don't do for my otherwise what I do for you, Rich said. I don't shower with the other ladies when they're pregnant. You should be grateful that I give you more of my time and love than I do them. Why should she be grateful? Because this is yet another way for those other people to get upset with her and feel like she's in the wrong when you are in the wrong for asking this of her, knowing whatever y'all beliefs are. I swallowed my pride and decided to be grateful for the attention, even if I suspected he said similar things to some of his other wives. It was frustrating that sharing my husband still bothered me, but I couldn't help it. The following month, we received the startling news that father's conviction in Utah had been reversed, really, by the Supreme Court because of a faulty jury instruction. The Supreme Court said that the trial judge should have told the jury that they couldn't find father guilty unless he specifically intended Alyssa Wall's husband to force her to have non-consensual sex. Alyssa was willing to testify a second time if there was a new trial, but the prosecutors were undecided about trying the case again. If she is underage, then this should have been a problem, no matter what you said to the jury, but whatever, let me stay in my regular people lane. In the meantime, Texas was gearing up to extradite father to face charges there, and he remained in prison until the various authorities decided what to do with him. As always, father's legal troubles didn't stop him from sending messages to the people. In August, he sent one to Rich, telling him to go to R-17 to receive further training. Father was still limited to communication with that land of refuge, so Rich had to go there to speak with him. I wonder why he has chosen Rich to be his mouthpiece. It's like he's still making sure that he has a way of controlling what's going on, not with just everyone else, but with Rachel. And the best way to do that is by keeping Rich close. Rich took me with him so I could see my family. Excuse me. While Rich was off getting his training, I spent time with my brothers and sisters. It was great to see them just as it always was. But Angela told me father had been sending weird corrections to the people lately. 
Many men have been sent away from their homes and families for minor infractions, like missing a men's morning prayer or building a structure the wrong way. Often, there was no reason given at all. I didn't see Rich all day. When he came to bed that night, he was behaving standoffish and out of sorts. I put my arm around him, hoping to comfort him over whatever was bothering him, but he quickly removed my arm. What's the matter? Rich had never done that before. Select men had been given a revelation that we as husbands and wives can no longer have marital relations. Who gave him this, mar who gave him this revelation? Because what do you mean that you can't have marital relations? This is all because of the father. If the father can't do it, he doesn't want them to do it. Really? I tried to hide my dismay, but failed. The Lord wants us to prove worthy of greater ordinances and blessings by sacrificing our selfishness and wanting to show love to one another. Wow. The way that they switch up stuff is so dangerous. I wonder why Father was doing this to us. I do too. I suspected it was because he didn't want us to have something he couldn't have behind bars. That's exactly what it was. He can't get no cookie, so you can't get no nookie. <laughs> Going forward, Rich still invited his wives to sleep in his bed, but he was extra cautious about touching us, and there were no more showers together. He gave us good morning hugs and good night kisses, but nothing else. He was determined to obey the prophet because he didn't want to lose his place in the church or lose his family. Because you know, if they don't follow the rules, then what happens is they get sent away. And we know that this man loves to be with his wives. So more than likely him being with his wives would result in them being pregnant, which would prove that he was doing something that he wasn't supposed to do. This pregnancy turned out to be one of the hardest because Rich was so careful not to show me too much love. He was grateful that we were having this baby. Who knew when we might be able to have another one? And he treated me kindly, but the distance was hard for me. Rich was now the bishop of R23 in South Dakota, so he received a lot of personal messages from Father. That's so convenient. I suspected that if Father knew Rich still shared his bed with us, he would be angry, since he believed no one could control their physical desires just like he couldn't. I got a few messages from Father here and there, mostly telling me how to be a better wife and mother. It seemed to me he wasn't in a very good position to tell me how to be a better person, but then he never had been. Exactly. How you sitting here giving all these rules to these people when you're locked up, they won't let you out. Woo! They won't let you out. You are locked up. <laughs> I'm just saying, you're locked up. Shut up. I had my little boy in March, 2011. Father named him Nathaniel. I actually like that name. The following month, the new meeting house was nearly complete. It was only missing the decks on the upper floors, so we could now have Sunday gatherings in it. Ooh, excuse me. The structure was designed to serve as a school as well, and we mothers were excited that our children would be able to go to a real school and have real teachers. I always play piano in general meetings, so my sister wives looked after my children while we sang and prayed. One Sunday, after we had just finished singing and a member was saying the prayer, I heard a loud scream in the hall. One of my sister wives, Suzanne, came into the meeting room carrying my son, Rulon, who was there, and then he was, at that point, he was three. He was very pale and limp. What happened? I was terribly upset. Just as prayer was starting, Rulon ran out of the door at the end of the hall where there's no deck. Oh! He'd fallen two stories onto the concrete sidewalk. You picked him up? You never pick someone up when they have an accident like that. You're supposed to leave them be and call 911. What if he broke his neck? Suzanne was on the edge of tears. I knew it wasn't her fault, but right then I was so scared for my little boy that I didn't care. Rich took Rulon in his arms and carried him out to his Ford expedition. Can we take him to the hospital? As I said, 
I said, as I followed him out, not without permission from your father, Rich, you're full of crap. Rich, you're full of crap. Your son just dropped off of a deck two stories onto concrete because y'all dummies didn't close off this area. You had this meeting place and you had a little child who wandered outside and who plummeted to concrete. And you're sitting here questioning whether or not you should take the child to the hospital. I have to talk to your, your father who's in prison. You can't make a single decision without him. Do you have to ask him to wipe your booty? Do you have to ask for that too? Because this is ridiculous to me. Okay, I need to calm down. I am hot. But I'm just picturing that image of this baby and your response is, I got to call your daddy first. But Rulon can hardly move. What if something in his back is broken? I could tell Rich was not happy with how upset I was. I tried to sweetly put my point across that I was serious about taking him in for help, but it was crazy that I had to beg him to get our son, his son, the medical treatment he clearly needed. Exactly. Rachel, we're on the same page. And I don't know how you remain so calm because I wouldn't be asking to do anything. At that point, I would be doing it. Rachel, I will give him a blessing and he will be fine. Back home, <laughs> Rich carried Rulon into his room and laid him on a reclining chair. Rulon had a huge bump on his forehead and he was weak and he could hardly make a sound. So he obviously has a concussion and you're laying him down and you're not getting him medical treatment. Rich gave him a blessing while I held his hand. I was angry at Suzanne. I was angry at the men who had not secured an upper story door where there was no deck yet. I was angry at Rich for not letting Rulon go to the hospital. I hid my face in my arm because I didn't want my little boy to see me crying. Rich took Rulon into his arms and held him. After a few minutes, I walked out of the room and called my sister Marianne, who was living at Father's house in R23. Please ask Isaac to tell Rich to take Rulon to the hospital so we can make sure he's okay, I said. Uncle Isaac was the most senior person in the church and father, after father, but he usually wouldn't do anything without father say so. Marianne said she would ask anyway. That night, Rulon started to scream in pain. I didn't know what to do for him because I didn't know what was causing it. Aside from the bump on his head, there were no outward signs of injury. I gave him Tylenol, but it didn't seem to help much. I was a wreck. I had a newborn, a one-year-old, and a three-year-old who couldn't walk or sleep because he was suffering so much. I don't think I could put up with this much longer, I said to Rich in the morning. I really want to take him to a doctor. Just wait a little longer and we'll see if he starts feeling better. Oh my God, this baby. Jeez Louise, I was furious. Rich tried to console me, but I turned my back on him. Rachel, if he isn't walking in a few days, I will take him to the doctor. And here's the crazy thing. This can be the difference from that baby being able to walk or not. Time is of the essence when it comes to spinal injuries and head injuries. He could have internal bleeding for all they know, but they're so careless and they're so indoctrined and they're so stockholmed and stuck that they don't realize they could be costing this baby his life i said nothing but minded my rage yesterday right after he fell that was the time not just to take him to a doctor but to call an ambulance what was wrong with you this child needs help i sat on the couch next to my son and wept later that day Uncle Isaac called Rich and told him that father wanted Rulon to go to the doctor. Actually, I think he's doing better. What? No, no, he isn't. We need to take him. Finally, that afternoon, Rich took Rulon and me to the hospital where the medical staff thought we were crazy for not calling 911 in the first place. It was impossible to explain the reasons we hadn't. Rulon was diagnosed with a broken pelvis. Y'all hear this. He wanted prayer to uh, miraculously heal this little boy. And here's the thing. I'm a believer. So I'm not trying to act like there's not think such a thing as miracles and faith can't heal in certain things. But it doesn't always happen. If that was the case, 
then my brother wouldn't be gone. My aunts, some of my aunts wouldn't be gone. Some of your aunts wouldn't be. We wouldn't have lost family members and loved ones if that was the case. So we have to be realistic with the stuff, right? So here he is. You had him go through all this pain. He was screaming out. I told y'all it was a two-story drop. Broken pelvis, a broken hip, and a major concussion. He did not walk for several weeks. I was not surprised by the doctor's diagnosis, given how much pain my son seemed to be in. We would have to go back to the doctor repeatedly over the next few months to make sure that the growth plate in his hip was okay. I was pleased that my son was healing, but it shouldn't have been so difficult to get him the help he needed. I could not understand how Richard's obedience to a man in prison was more important than the well-being of his own child. Good for you, Rachel. Hurry up and get yourself and your kids out of there. A few weeks after Rulon's accident, father sent a revelation to the president of the United States. That was how we learned that Osama bin Laden had been killed. Father's messages for President Barack Obama said that God had shown Father that the world was wicked for celebrating the notorious terrorist death. We might not have known anything about the leader of Al-Qaeda or what happened on September 11, 2001, if Father had not felt it was important enough of an event that the people had been allowed to watch television news on that day. Our grandmother still had a television back then, although most of us were forbidden to watch anything but those few children's movies at my sister Becky and I had watched that my sister Becky and I had watched when we were little girls. The prohibition against television was reinstated a day or two later when father told the people they were being distracted by the events of the world and neglecting their own preparation for father's deliverance and priesthood blessings. Okay, so now he's probably going to blame the people for the reason why he's there because y'all aren't suffering enough in order for me to get out because that's the way people like him think. Years later, when I saw documentaries about bin Laden, the man's ability to brainwash his people to do his bidding, it reminded me very much of my father. Since Rich was now bishop, our house was the center of the action at R23. Rich had an office at home and people were always coming and going to meetings with him. There were new buildings under construction and the crews continued to struggle with impossible to meet deadlines. So there was plenty to keep Rich busy. Father's wives did most of the storehouse work, which gave me and my sister wives more time to homeschool our children. The school we hoped for in the meeting house never opened. Work in the gardens and keep our home tidy, which was a big challenge with that many children in the house. Since none of us were having relations with Rich, the tension that had always been there seemed to dissipate. If Rich stayed out work late, the five of us would sit around and gossip to relax. After getting all the children settled in their beds, even though we weren't supposed to, we laughed and sang songs when we were working together at our daily chores too. And we didn't talk about the fact that we were all going without physical affection, but it served as an unspoken bond among us and brought us closer. Thanks to Father, those happy days were about to change once more. Chapter 17, The Noose Tightens. When the prosecutors in Utah declined to retry father, he was immediately extradited to Texas to face charges there stemming from evidence collected at R-17 during the raid in 2008. Father's trial began in late 2011, in July 2011, in San Angelo. Father had hired and fired several attorneys before he decided to represent himself. Of course, because he just knows everything. Why wouldn't he make sure he took care of it? The judge ordered that one of the attorneys stay on as standby counsel, but left father to his own defense. The prosecutor presented two felony charges. The first was for the aggravated sexual assault of one of father's wives who had just been 12 years old. So that picture that I showed you all last chapter of her standing beside him in a blue dress, she was this, this little girl was the same age, 12 years old. I know a lot of times we see 12 year olds that don't look like 12 year olds. I don't care. I don't care if they look like grown behind women. The point is she was 12 years old and he knew. Her mind is not that of an adult. Her body is not ready for things that adults do and decisions that adults have to make. But here you are and you as a grown man have forced yourself upon her because nobody can tell him no, right? 
too. Mm -mm -mm. The second charge was for sexual assault of another wife, a 15-year-old. While the prosecutor described the evidence to be presented, including documents, audio, and video recordings, and DNA analysis, father remained silent at the defense table. Father raised no objections until the next day, in fact, and when he did, he spoke for over an hour, and the gist was that he was claiming religious freedom. Later that day, he read a revelation to the court while the jury was out of the room. I, the Lord God of heaven, call upon the court to now cease this persecution against my holy way. He went on to essentially threaten that the prosecution would be humbled by sickness and death. So you're threatening these people under the guise of God. I know that they have you swear on a Bible, but that's not going to go well over in court. The judge reprimanded him and forbade him from saying anything like that in front of the jury. One of Grandfather Rulon's wives, Rebecca Muser, she had left the church after his death because father had insisted she marry again and she didn't want to, testified about the role of women in the FLDS and told the court that their salvation, according to the church, came from submitting to their husbands. But it was father's careful record keeping of his own life that had given the state its case. The prosecution only had to read what father had written or instructed others to write on his behalf, including descriptions of the assaults on his wives. During some of these graphic recitals, father objected repeatedly after invoking the Lord. There was even an hour long audio tape of father giving instructions to a quorum of 12 ladies about having group sex. Finally, a DNA expert confirmed that father had sired a baby with, this, with his 15-year-old wife. Another record provided the assault, pr proved the assault on the 12-year-old in which he had addressed her by name. Father didn't have much of a defense. His only witness was a member of the church who didn't do anything for father's case. It took the jury four hours to convict him on both counts. Good job, jury. Very good job, jury. The penalty phase of the trial introduced a raft of new information about father's 78 wives. Y'all heard me? 78 wives, many of whom had been grandfather's wives before he died. Father's own mothers, in other words. That's disgusting. That's disgusting. And nearly a third of them were underage. The state also presented evidence of all the polygamous marriage he'd performed. Families he'd broken up, men he'd sent away, and additional sexual assaults on children, including his own underage brides. The state knew nothing about father's relationship with me. He had kept no records of that. Father chose not to be in the courtroom during this part, so he relinquished his defense to the standby attorney while he waited in while he waited it out in a room across the hall with a guard. Interesting how when your truths come out, how when your writings come out, how you're a coward that can't even face the very words that you wrote, how you're given the ability to go into another room. He should have been made to sit there and to listen to his acts because it's really easy not to have to face what you did. But if what you did is so right, why not be in that courtroom when it's being told to the 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 courtroom, the judge, the jury, to the, the people, the witnesses. Why not say it then? It took the jury less than an hour on August 9, 2011 to come back with father's sentence, life in prison. And I told y'all before, I feel like he deserved more than that. I feel like he deserved the death penalty. I do. Because you may not have murdered someone uh, at your hands, but you murdered their spirit. You murdered their self-worth. You took away their moms. You took away their fathers. You changed life for a lot of them. Some of them will never recover from what he did. It's generation by generation of families that have been harmed because of this. It's one thing for you to pra practice plural marriage. It's another thing for you to force it and uh, wives and husbands and babies and things of that nature upon people. As usual, Father took his suffering out on the people. 
Even as the trial was underway, he continued to regularly send revelations and life got stricter with every single one. Father had already been a big believer that cleanliness was next to godliness, but now we were required to submit a written report to the bishop saying that we had deep cleaned every inch of the house the way the Lord had directed us to. Why is this something that is even important? He doesn't have anything better to do than to read reports about how, oh, my shelf right there is dusty. So I took all of the pictures off and I brushed them off and I wiped each picture individually. Like, what does the, the report entail? I took two cobwebs out of the ceiling. I saw a little spider on it and I think I got rid of it. But then the next day, the spider was back and had formed an even bigger cobweb. Like, what are we saying here? Oh, Jesus. The directions were very specific. Start by cleaning with your right hand. What? Start by cleaning with your right hand on the center of the ceiling in each room and work down from there. Hold the clean rags in the right hand. Right hands must never touch anything dirty. When the rag became dirty, we were to take it with our left hand and wash it. Left hands were for touching anything soiled. It was the same thing for getting dressed. We were instructed to put our clothes on right side first, right sleeve, right sock, right shoe, before putting on the left. The order of things was very important. Let me tell you something. There is no way you gonna tell me how to put on my underwear and my socks and my shoes and my shirt. Put that on right side first. This is insane. I did not know that it got this bad. Our fruit, our food restrictions became tighter as well. Father forbade potatoes, milk, beans, squash, peas, oats, onions, and garlic, which made it challenging to cook a meal that tasted of anything. So because he's eating prison food, they got to suffer by eating food. Yeah, no, nah, bye y'all. I'm out. It's been great. Find a family friend somewhere. I got to go. We were encouraged to eat mostly wheat products. Women and children were also required to drink an eight ounce cup of water twice an hour on the hour, precisely. Laughter was deemed light-mindedness and therefore a sin. Children were required to have a mother's guiding hand at all times of the day rendering them incapable of taking care of their own most basic needs as they grew older. The people were also told that everything they possessed, all of their money and personal items, actually now belong to the church. Of course it did, because if I take away all your money, how are you going to get away from me? Every month, the people were required to take inventory of their personal possessions and turn the documentation into the bishop. And once a year, the people would be required to take all of their personal belongings to the church store to consecrate it to the Lord. Then they were allowed to take back only what they needed to stay alive. I could only imagine that father's incarceration had sent him over the edge and coming up with these rules and revelations about minute things in our lives kept his mind occupied in his prison cell. Goodness gracious. When father wasn't making the rules, he was sending more and harsher corrections. Father told Rich that he was displeased with him for not meeting a construction deadline and he was therefore no longer the Bishop of South Dakota. Rich was to leave R23 and take his family to R1 in Mykonos, Colorado to live. This is so crazy, y'all. The day after receiving father's message, Rich seemed very depressed. I went to his room and closed the door behind me. Rich, I said, everything is going to be okay. I know that heavenly father loves you. I gave him a hug and he lay on me down on his bed and kissed me. I love you so much, he said. I'm glad you love and trust me too. I smiled as I looked up into his blue eyes and thought, why does father have to tear down everyone? Rich suddenly realized what we were doing and quickly stood up. It took us a week to pack up the belongings of six adults and a brood, 
that now numbered 22 children. We took the children over to father's house so they could be tended by his many childless wives. The little, lo the little ones loved all the attention and the cooing, and we didn't have to worry about what mischief they were getting up to while we worked at packing. A couple days before we left R23, one of father's wives, Lana, told me that my sister Angela was on her way to live there in South Dakota and was expected to arrive on Saturday. Father said specifically that Rich's family had to believe by Friday, so it was clear that Father was intentionally keeping me away from my closest sisters in case I had ever doubted it. I secretly called Angela. Why do you finally get to move here now that I'm moving away? Angela was as disappointed as I was. I was excited that I was going to see you, she said. That Friday, after the men finished hauling our belongings out to the trailers, Rich brought a small shuttle bus to accommodate all of his wives and children. We were sad to be leaving South Dakota as it became our home for almost eight years. Rich had been kind and caring Bishop, and all the people there were sad that he would be replaced. Many said as much, and the 60 or so men working under Rich's directions were devoted to him. As we drove off, one of the windows fell out of the bus, and all the men rushed to help us happy for an excuse to spend a little more time with Rich. We had made a lot of long, difficult road trips, traveling between lands of refuge and houses of hiding, but driving 12 hours straight with nearly two dozen children was a special challenge. At first, the children were excited. We're moving to a new house and a new place. They laid their pillows and blankets in the coziest spot they could find, and they got really silly and wild talking and laughing until one of the mothers told them to be quiet and calm down because you know they're not supposed to be laughing too much. My baby Nathaniel was fussy, so I was focused on him most of the ride. The R1 property was cool and secluded, high up a mountain. The pines were giant, the underbrush thick, and there were several ponds on the land. The garden was full and nearly ready to harvest when we arrived. There were cosmos and black-eyed Suzannes growing wild everywhere. The chicken pen was well secured because of frequent bear visits. There were several milking cows, a bull, and a few calves that the children were excited to feed and take care of. We had lived in two houses because there wasn't a single house big enough for our family. The men had built a huge log home in 2004, but father had the crew break it down in 2010 because a man he judged immoral had lived there. You see what I'm saying about how he does these things? Father even told the workmen not to save any appliances, sewing machines, dishes, or furniture because it was all marred by that man's corruption. So every inch of the house was destroyed and hauled off the land. Grass was planted in its footprint, and that area is considered corrupt to this day. But y'all supposed to be people of faith. So why couldn't we pray over this property and ask for God to cleanse it? Why do we have to tear everything apart? One of our homes was up on a hill and the other one down below, next to a creek that flowed through the property year round. Rich had most of the family lived down at the lower level house because it had more bedrooms. The upper house had a large kitchen, so we made meals and ate there. Every morning after six o'clock prayer and reading, we would put coats on the children and walk up the steep, narrow trail to the upper house for breakfast. It was important to Rich that all the children make it to breakfast on time and eat together. Rich became the bishop of R1 shortly after we moved there, and he was pretty darn happy about it, mostly because he was glad that he had father's confidence again. Each wife had their special job. Suzanne took care of the milk and made cottage cheese, sour cream, and cream cheese. So I thought they weren't supposed to be eating milk, but we'll see. Molly did the milking and took care of the chickens. Gloria took care of the garden and Trish prepared most of the meals. All of us mothers and all of the children helped with the dishes, excuse me, house cleaning, harvesting the garden, and any other general duties. Rich put me in charge of running the storehouse as well as keeping track of every transaction to manage the financial incomings and outgoings on the land. It was also my job to teach school for the five oldest children, grades three through five. I wasn't keen to do so since I had baby Nathaniel to look after, but Rich tried to make me feel better about it. 
If I was one of those children and I had to choose one of the mothers to be my teacher, I would choose you, he said. There was a small crew of men on the land, but Rich's wives were the only women there. Suzanne and I were always being told by the other sister wives and Rich that men were looking at us and getting too friendly. Our jobs required us to communicate with everyone, including the men. But every time one of the men came to talk to me, Rich would summon me to a private appointment with him where he would explain to me the error of my ways. Oh my goodness, you can't handle your wife interacting with a the man, then do the job yourself because you want her to keep sweet. Here she is being sweet and it's a problem. It got to where I couldn't even talk to my brother-in-law, Danny Allred, without getting in trouble. Rich must have written to father that the men were texting and talking to his wives because we suddenly got a new revelation explaining that texting was not of God. It was no longer permissible. You're not allowed to use a text message. I'm sorry, but that sounds crazy. But I got to remind myself, Stockholm Syndrome. We were told that we would lose our place in our families and in the church if we sent a text message. The men also got a firm correction about getting too friendly with the women. Just living was becoming a sin. Father's next revelation was that the the cocoa and chocolate were not approved by the Lord for us to eat. Y'all, he's going to keep going. This is not, At this point, what are they supposed to eat? Grain? Like a little piece of grain? Also for, forbidden now were corn, cabbage, and cottage cheese because these foods would make our body sickly. I got my classroom ready by September 1st, the day after Father required everyone in the church to start school. I tried to think up anything that could be entertaining that wasn't technically a game. We often studied by the stream when the weather was good. Sometimes I would let the children try to catch a fish in the stream with their hands, and they were actually successful a few times. Other times we would go for a four-wheeler ride and take walks or chase cows. The sister wives were always supportive of my teaching of their children, but I enjoyed spending the time with the kids, and the kids appreciated it. Father's next message was a surprise. Uncle Isaac told us that Father wanted to see my sister Becky and me. He had been sent to the prison and hospital in Galveston, Texas with pneumonia. Father had not allowed me to visit him since his arrest five years earlier. All of his adult children had seen him except me, which to make myself feel better about the rejection, I had chalked up to his guilty conscience. Please understand that even that is a ploy to make her feel away because everything that he does, he does it for a reason. Rich drove me with baby Nathaniel to Galveston on September 5th so we could see father the next day. Becky went separately with David and their youngest child. I was mostly excited about the trip because I would get to see the sea for the first time ever. As we got close to the bay, a sense of excitement filled me. I wanted to shout out like a child as I looked over at the water, but I didn't. Instead, I sat there as a sense of satisfaction settled over me. I explained, I exclaimed, oh, it's so beautiful. Isaac Jess had gotten us a room in a hotel next to the water. We had to stop there to freshen up before going to the prison hospital. When I stepped out of the truck at the hotel and breathed in the salty air, I felt a strong sense of contentness. I love it here, I said to no one in particular. We got changed and then drove over to the hospital. The prison hospital was a tall white building with a dark window, with dark windows. At the appointed time, Rich and I took an elevator to the seventh floor where we met up with Becky and David. Rich and David were going to babysit while we went to see Father. Becky and I showed our IDs to the attendant and he took us through the door leading to the inmates. It was eerie to walk through the iron doors and have them shut behind us, knowing they were meant to keep dangerous people inside. It was a strange thing to realize that my father was considered dangerous enough to be locked up even though I had been subjected to his bad actions, a part of me still felt sad that this is where he ended up. Inside, two guards escorted us down a long hall and into Father's room. I didn't recognize the man in the bed. He was very thin and his head was shaved bald. Rachel, you will act like Father looks like you remember him, even though he doesn't, I thought. I walked over to Father and kissed him on the cheek and then sat down 
on a chair at the end of his hospital bed. Becky followed suit. Becky was very nervous and fidgety. She had been going through a lot of family struggles and she believed that father could read her mind. I wanted to tell Becky to calm down that father really couldn't see every little thing about her life. Father asked us how we were doing. I smiled and said really well. Becky said so too. He talked to us about how to be good priesthood mothers and how to raise up children of Zion. I'm not coming all the way here for you to give me another one of your many pep talks. What do you want? Becky opened his lunch container, which was sitting on the table. So what are they, you, they feeding you? She asked as she opened it. Don't touch it. You don't need to touch it, father said. I could see it was fish with white rice and broccoli. So he's telling them that they shouldn't eat things that he himself is eating. Okay, Becky said, covered it back up and putting her hands back in her lap. It looks better than I thought. Father often complained that they didn't feed him very well. And I don't think he wanted us to know otherwise. Rachel, you are on the right path, he said. You are doing very well and the Lord is pleased with you. Then he said to Becky, you need to be at peace. I didn't want to say anything wrong to make father judge me unworthy of any blessings. So I mostly sat quietly and let him do the talking. After an hour, the guards told us our time was up and escorted us out. It was 5.30 p.m. when Rich and I got back to the hotel. Rich wanted to know every detail of our visit. I gave him the overview, but I had a more pressing issue. The Gulf of Mexico was calling me. I have to get in the ocean, I said. When will I get another chance? It's going to be dark soon, Rich said. Are you sure? Very. The beach was just across the street down a few stairs. We didn't have swimsuits. They were forbidden. So I took off my shoes and socks and walked into the surf in my dress. Rich was holding Nathaniel back on the sidewalk. Come down here. The water is very warm. I don't want to get my clothes wet, Rich shouted. Please. It's so often. It was so awesome. Rich gave, gave, gave in and joined me. A storm was blowing in, so the water was quite rough, but it made for a beautiful evening. The sunset was magnificent. With lovely tones of pink and lavender spread across the sky, it was one of the best evenings I had in a very long time. There in the ocean with, the husband, with my husband and baby. I felt happy. Father must have enjoyed our visit. He sent kind messages to me for a while, afterward addressing me as my sweet daughter, Rachel, or my loving daughter, Rachel, and telling me he loved me, which he hadn't done in a very long time. One morning, Rich came to me and said that he wanted to take Ruan to work with him. A few late hours later, he called me at the upper house. Rachel, come to my room. When I got to the lower house, I found Rich holding Rulon, who was wailing. Look at this, he said, as he started rolling up Rulon's pant leg. I gasped when I saw the six inch gash that bloomed on Rulon's lower leg. We are going to the hospital, I said. Now, don't you think we could stitch it up or something? You can see the bone, Rich. If you don't want to take him to the hospital, I will go without you. Perhaps remembering the last time he argued for a blessing over an injury that had left Rulon unable to walk for two weeks, Rich acquiesced. On the way, he told me that while he was helping the other men pour cement for the foundation, Rulon had started playing with the jumping jack, the heavy tool that pounds the cement, and somehow it tipped over onto his leg. I mean, what? He shouldn't have been there. The weight of the jack ripped his calf muscle clean off the bone. Rulon received 40 stitches that day. The doctor had to sew up the inside as well as the outside to hold his leg together. And you were wondering if you should take him to the hospital or not. At least he didn't push back like he did the first time. We were an accident prone family it seemed. Gloria, Molly, and I were down at the lower house with the younger children when Molly's daughter Rihanna and Barbie came running in breathless. Mother Trish died, Mother Trish died. Trish had taken the four oldest girls and her baby on a four-wheeler ride. I took both girls by the hand. Calm down. You don't need to yell. Show us where she is. We followed the girls down the mountain a little ways to the stream. Trish was laying on the ground unconscious and the girls were by her, sky, her side screaming and crying. Trish had been driving up a steep hill when she hit a rock. 
The four-wheeler had tipped over on top of them and then rolled at the bottom of the hill. Trish clearly needed help, so I ran to get Rich, who was in the storehouse having men's prayer. I knocked on the door, and he gave me a look that said, how dare I disturb them. Trish is hurt bad, I said. Rich's face lost his stern expression and went pale as he jumped up. He and Thomas Roundy, one of the laborers at R1, followed me to where Trish was laying on the ground. Her daughter, Sarah, was hurt too. Her knee was dislocated and her arm was broken. The other girls seemed to be okay. Since Rich was the bishop in Colorado, everyone looked to him for direction. But all he said was, what should we do? Everyone was so used to needing permission to go to a doctor that even after our multiple experiences with our children, Rich and the others were paralyzed without guidance. This is when we call 911, I said. I took my phone out of my pocket and dialed 911. No one protested. I stayed on the phone with dispatch while they sent an ambulance and life flight helicopter. The police arrived too to take an accident report. Rich told them that Trish had been riding with only Sarah because it was probably a violation of some kind to have so many children on one vehicle. Later that night, I was talking to Barbie. Where did you land when the four-wheeler tipped over? I don't know what happened, mother. I felt us tipping over and then I felt like I was on a pillow. When I opened my eyes, R Rihanna and I were at the top of the hill looking down at mother. Trish and the other girls were at the bottom. Rihanna told a similar story. I was so grateful that my daughter wasn't hurt. I believed it was a miracle. Trish was pretty badly injured. The four-wheeler had landed right on top of her during the fall and crushed several ribs and her wrist was badly broken. The doctors at the hospital kept her heavily sedated for two weeks so she could heal. Rich stayed with her almost constantly coming home only to shower and change clothes. When father heard about the accident, he sent a revelation that God did not accept four-wheelers on his land of refuge. This was a big blow for everyone. It was hard to get around the lands of refuge without four-wheelers because they could go to where vehicles couldn't. We used them to herd the cattle, to carry building supplies to remote locations and run errands. Truckloads of them were taken off the lands of refuge as well as Short Creek. He just labels everything as a sin. Four-wheelers had become the new sin. Trish was finally released from the hospital after more than a month. We were also glad to have her and Rich back home. Then father sent a new revelation that Rich read to us at Sunday meetings. Husbands and wives. Y'all listen to this. They already can't have sexual relations. Now they can no longer hug each other. Only a quick handshake was acceptable to God. Father told us that God wanted us to give up our selfish way of loving one another, that we would be taught a new way to love. It was one thing to go without sex, but totally another thing to go without affection, period. Father really wants us to feel how he feels, I thought. In my heart, I did not accept this revelation, which would essentially make my husband less than a brother to me. Our children would never see that their parents loved each other and the parents would have to erase or at least deny their own love for each other. I couldn't imagine how things could get any worse until they did. A few short weeks after she returned, Trish received a correction from father. She was to go to Short Creek to repent. Rich blamed me for it. This lady was in the hospital for a month and you're blaming her. If she didn't go to the hospital, she would have died. Mm -hmm. Rich blamed me for it. I can only imagine it was because I was father's daughter. Rich was angry about what father had done and taking it out on me was the closest he would get to making father pay. A few days after Trish left, Rich came to my room. I want you to pack your stuff. I'm sending you to Short Creek until I get a message from your father about what to do with you. You can take your youngest two children. I thought he was joking. He had never done anything like this to me before. I hadn't done anything to warrant this kind of punishment, but I had to obey. Rich had the authority as my husband and my bishop of R1. Uh, yeah, Rich would have been getting a police call and I would have been taking all my children with me. Forget this mess. I believe that once I wrote to father and explained the situation, though, he would make sure I returned to the rest of my children. Probably not, girl. Thomas Roundy drove me and the two little ones, Lavender and Nathaniel, to Short Creek. So her other son that you keep on having accidents happen with, he, Rulon, wasn't allowed to go. I wrote to father immediately. It was the only thing that I could do to fix this mess, or so I thought. 
It often took up to several weeks for messages from father to travel back to the people. After the expected amount of time passed, Rich showed up at my room. Father had instructed him to move his whole family to father's family's former home in Short Creek. The house which had previously housed father's many children and wives was used by the bishop, John Wayman, but father instructed him to clear it out for us. It was far too big for Rich's family, and I hated the thought of living among my memories of this place. Although she was already in Short Creek, Trish was not allowed to live with us. Rachel, do you want your mother's room? Rich asked. No, I couldn't get the word out of my mouth fast enough. My sister wives looked surprised. Why wouldn't you want your mother's room? Because was all I could say. I was happy to have all my children with me, but I hated Short Creek as much as I ever had. I missed the openness of the lands of refuge. The children did too. Here we were surrounded by walls and the barren desert. It felt suffocating and very boring. And that is where I'm going to end. It seems like he is just getting more and more and like he's toxic. Her father is toxic and he's taking out his frustrations on the people just because he can. Mm. Oh, y'all see my new cup? It's a Stanley. This, <laughs> this is not a commercial thing. Um, I know everybody didn't see it, but I have put like a little, I went live, um, uh, what, a week ago. Was it a week ago? Time is losing me. I think it was a week ago. I have went on a trip with some friends to uh, some campgrounds in Williamsburg, Virginia, and we had a ball. It was glamping and they made each of us little kits. And in our kits, we all got a Stanley cup. Everybody's was different. My favorite color, for those of you that don't know, I love blues, like the blue family, the teals, certain greens, but like this is my, blue is my go-to. So when I saw this, it may look purple on camera because in certain light, it looks purple. I was so excited and I thought it was so thoughtful because Stanley cups are not cheap. And this isn't a manly, this is actually a Stanley. Like it has a little lifetime warranty card inside and everything. So I think that is so cool. And it was so thoughtful of my friends and I had such a great time. I know that's off topic, but I just got excited looking at it. Um, like the video, if you haven't done so already, let me know what you thought about this chapter. Well, these two chapters, what stood out the most for me it's definitely got to be how Rich reacted to Rulon's falling on concrete. That was too much. Until next time.